take it back. Wow, he's excited. God is doing some amazing things already in the meeting this morning. And I know that he, he said to me that some supernat- he wants to do something so great and supernatural. And he already has, but he's going to do some more. So how about um, we pray this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me this opportunity to speak for you, Jesus. That, Lord, I just surrender everything I am to you. That, Lord, I'm your representative today. I pray that I would represent you well. I pray, Lord, that um, you know how I've prepared and planned. And, Father, I pray that you would intervene in that, God. That, Lord, the Holy Spirit would just, oh, saturate us, Lord, this morning. Lord, I just release hilarious joy over your people this morning. I release embracing love. I release strength over your people. I release courage this morning. Father, I thank you for that, God, and I just give everything to you, and I pray that you would receive the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I had a, a title for this message, I would say, Transformed by His Love. And the Lord led me to Joshua, chapter 1. Also, I'm going to read some other scriptures from 3 and 4. This is an amazing account. I don't like to say story because, you know, it's not a story. It's the, it's the word of God and it's so true. His word is true. His word is, he's faithful to his word. So I'll just start to read Joshua 1, verses 2 and 3. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give you. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Joshua 3, verses 15, 16 and 17. I just wanted to give you an overview of what I'm going to say this morning because there's two aspects of what God has shown me. There's so many elements in in this um, account of how, how God parted the River Jordan and set the people uh, and they crossed that river. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. The priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord in the middle of the Jordan and stood on gr- dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation, the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And you know what? Right now I sense the Holy Spirit is saying, get ready to cross your Jordan. Get ready to take the promises of God because God is there. And you know what? I feel right now that we need to activate that. I I feel that we need to stand up and declare that we're going to cross the Jordan. We're going to take a hold of the promises of God. And I just really believe there's people here today that you've been declaring and believing for the Word of God. And you know, you've waited, you've waited for so long but now God's saying it's ready to cross your Jordan it's ready to take a hold of the promises of God so right now we're not going to be passive we're going to decree and declare that we're going to cross our Jordan and take a hold of what God has done for us so right now you know as as uh, the walls of Jericho came down as they gave a shout and we're going to give a shout to the Lord this morning that we're ready to cross our Jordan so one two three shout Lord we're ready to take our Jordan this morning. Lord, we're ready. Father, we take a hold of the promises of God. Father, we take a hold of what you've done for us. Father, we're ready. We decree, Lord God, that Father, we're ready to take the promises. Father, we're not looking to the old anymore. We leave the old behind. And Father, we're ready to take our Jordan this morning. Father, we declare and we declare. And Father, we give you a shout in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. Get ready because I've got a lot more activations for you to do today. (laughs) In Joshua chapter 4, verses 5 and 9, the New Living Translation says, and I need to read this to give you um, an overview of what I'm going to talk about. He told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder, 12 stones in all one for each of the tribes of Israel. We'll use these stones to build a memorial. 
In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you will tell them. They reminded us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe. Just as the Lord had told Joshua, they carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant was standing and they are there to this day. And I really felt, you know, the river was overflowing its banks. And can you just, I just want you to picture this account, the river overflowing the banks, how muddy and, and the miry clay that it would have been as the priests walked down to the river edge. And, you know, as soon as the priests touched, uh, as soon as their feet touched the edge of the river, it, uh, the water started to, to go back and totally open the way for the people to cross over to the promised land. Just imagine, you know, that that riverbed was really wet and God, you know, the miracles that God performed in, in this account in Joshua is just so amazing that the God of miracles that did this right back then, he's here today. The God of miracles is here and we've seen him in our midst this morning that, you know, he dried, God had dried all that, that riverbed so that the priests went into the middle of the, of the river. And I was thinking, why did the priests go into the middle of the river? And I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, when the people cross, the presence of God was before them. And when they went across, the presence of God was behind them. So God was surrounding them as they crossed that river. And, you know, um, when I, I looked up the account of how many people would have crossed that river, and there was 2.5 million people. And it said that they crossed and they camped that night in Gilgal. And, you know, the meaning of the Jordan is judgment. And the meaning of Gilgal is um, the reproach has been rolled away. And that is such a beautiful, um, uh, you know, an account of, of just even as I thought about it when I got saved, you know, when you got saved, that the more, memorial, my heart goes back and I built a memorial there about the time when I was saved and how God had drew me out of the overwhelming waters. And he touched my life and the presence of God met me there. At that time when I got saved, my salvation was just so amazing. I could write a book about my salvation and how God had transformed my life. And I know that word is going to be said a lot, lot this morning because I know God wants to transform your life. It's a year of transformation. God wants you to get out of, out of the things that have um, tried to conform you into being transformed into his image from glory to glory. And you know, the stage of transformation, it's not just you get saved and you're this amazing, perfect being, but it's a stage, it's a process. And um, I'll just share a little bit about when I got saved that I was at a stage where my life was going nowhere. I was just, I had no purpose, no hope. I had um, relationships that were physically and emotionally abusive and... Um, and I was just crying out to God. You know, I didn't know. I said, if you're real, I want to know you. If you're real, I want you in my life. And um, no wonder the Lord gave me a beautiful, kind, loving husband like he did with Bob. And I'm so forever grateful for that, that God had touched me at that time in my life. And he wants you to remember, you know, the words um, memorial, the more memorial stones. I want you to picture right now memorial stones. You know, what God has done for you in 2019, not only 2019, but all the years before that, what God has done for you. Because he says there's so many accounts in the word where it says to remember, to remember, because God knows it's easy for us to forget what he's done for us. And, you know, so many times when we go through circumstances and we're saying, God, where are you? But he says, go back to that memorial stone. Remember what I did for you. Remember how I parted the waters for you. Remember what I did for you. I'm a God that is faithful. And he wants you to, to remember what he's, done, what he's done for you. 
that, you know, don't allow the circumstances to overwhelm and overtake your life because God is faithful and he will make that way for you like he did for the children of Israel. You know, that account is just so amazing how, that, how the River Jordan means judgment, that God takes you out of judgment into the promised land, that, you know, he takes you out, he's translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that you can be a beacon for him, that he, he saved you, he set you free. Don't ever forget that. Uh, Psalm 40 verse 2, I was thinking about the miry clay, that's how our experiences is most of the time. He takes us out of the miry clay and sets us on a, a rock that it, our feet um, that is steady. In Psalm 40 verse 2, it says, He stooped down to lift me out of danger from the desolate pit I was in, out of the muddy mess I had fallen into. Now he's lifted me into a firm, secure place. And steadied me while I walk along his ascending path. You know, he gives you beauty for ashes. He takes you out of that miry clay. But he always gives you beauty for ashes. And verse 3 says, A new song for a new day rises up in me. Every time I think about how he breaks through for me, a static praise pours out of my mouth until everyone knows how God has set me free. Many will see his miracles. They'll stand in awe of God and fall in love with him. And, you know, it was so great. um, It was so good. Uh, Pastor Steve in the last couple of weeks has mentioned a lot about, um, you know, just thinking about your salvation. And when he talked about that man that was so, he shouted out, he was always talking about how he got saved and how he um, praised God. Last week, Steve was talking about that man. I thought, wow, that's that was me. Everyone knew that Leslie was saved because I'd be the one. I, I, at that time, I was working in a nursing home and um, and I'd be with the girls smoking and, and talking about all the things you shouldn't be talking about. And all of a sudden, my life had so amazingly changed that I was one. I was the one down the end of the table and I couldn't get enough of reading the Word of God. And they'd say, well, what's happened to Leslie? She's she gone mad to religion, religious nut, you know. And, um, and I just couldn't stop talking about Jesus. And I know there may be some people here today that you don't know Jesus and we're going to give you an opportunity later to receive him as Lord and Saviour if there's anyone here because he'll he'll just totally transform your life. And, um, you know, it's about getting the word of God into your life, just devouring it. That's how you become transformed. We've been talking about being a good steward and, you know, we have to be a good steward of our own hearts. You know, God, not only of money, but of our hearts, of our life, of our lifestyle. We have to be a good steward in everything we do. Yeah, transformation is an ongoing process. That um, there is a change that takes place from one form to another. And the Greek word is for that is met- metamorphosis. And uh, I was thinking about the, um, the butterfly how, and, and I looked up all the stages. It goes through four stages. The caterpillar goes through four stages and sheds skin and um, before it becomes a beautiful butterfly. And during that process, yeah, it sheds the skin and when the butterfly starts to come out of the cocoon, it doesn't actually know that it can fly. And, you know, sometimes that's what our lives are like. We just don't know that we can fly. But God wants you to get a revelation of that today. He wants you to shed the old things, the old things that are are taking hold of your life. He wants you to lay them down today. That, um, you know, even though there's an inward thing that takes place in your life, transformation, love transforms you. Um, In... uh, as I go to, yeah, I went to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 out of that. And what trans, you know, the word says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the way we get transformed. It's not just living by a lot of principles. It's about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I just want to read those scriptures. Um, it says, Beloved friends, what should our proper response to God's marvellous mercies be? 
I encourage you to surrender. I want you to think of that word. Surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. But this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. And um, th- a few things stood out to me in those scriptures. One, one was surrender. We need to ac- come to a place of surrender. You know, you can't do it by yourself anymore. You, can't, you, you just can't do it by yourself. You have to surrender. You know, surrender your dreams, surrender your ideals, surrender everything to the Lord as a living sacrifice. And as you do that, he'll always resurrect it. He'll always resurrect something out of your life. And as we read there, holiness. Holiness simply means whatever delights his heart. It's not that you walk in holier than thou attitude, but it's whatever delights his heart. You know, at the, just to be as an example, um, I used to love a good thriller. And, uh, <laughs> and I used to watch those, yeah, you know, it, God had told me, hey, I don't want you to watch that anymore because it sort of stirs up something in my life that it's not, it's not God. And, and you go away thinking, oh, God, I just break out this fear. And, <laughs> and um, you know, I, I love a good thriller, but it's been a sacrifice to give up that. And so I've been, um, yeah, that's just a little example. But, you know, God's not talking about the big things in our lives. He's talking about those little things that, you know, that you're sitting in the front of the TV and you're you're loving a good thriller and he's saying, I don't really want you watching this. You know, it's just all those little things that God's talking to you about. And I love the um, the Message Bible. It says, um, take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, even you're eating. You have to surrender that sometimes. Hey, that's not good for me. <laughs> I've been trying to do that. I've been trying, <laughs> trying to surrender my eating and, um, and my sleeping. Well, don't stay up late and, you know, get up early in the morning. You know, going to work, that's a really good thing because sometimes you can be so, um, you know, the culture at your work can so come on you, you have to walk in there and be a different culture. I know when I used to work with community care and, um, and I'd go in the office and I'd, look, one girl couldn't stand it because I was so joyful in the morning. She'd say, oh, that Leslie, oh, she gets on my nerves. Because, you know, I'd, I'm, I'm a happy camper. I don't get cranky in the morning. My husband can attest to that. I'll get up and have my coffee and, and you know, I just, <laughs> I just can't stop laughing sometimes. And, I, and um, she'd get so annoyed. You know, I wasn't going to let her put that on me. And also um, another area is when, you know, they start talking, gossiping about everybody in, 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 you know, that you work with. And you have to stand up. You have to be, you have to be different in that culture. You have to, you have to be, you know, because you're God's representative. You know, if my children represented me bad, well, I'd think, what have I done? But that is a good example of, <laughs> she gives me the thumbs up there. Um, <laughs> oh, I love my family. They're just beautiful people. Um, yeah, so I wanted to expound also on renew. Renew means to make new. Get this one. Restore to freshness. I want everyone to say freshness. Freshness. You're going to be fresh because, you know, like you you get that old grumpy face off and you get a a bit of joy. You know, I um, I was listening the other day. Did you know that children laugh 400 times a day and adults laugh 15? That is pretty true, isn't it? I thought about it the other day. I thought, how many times have I laughed to myself today? I mean... You know, sometimes you do. You sit there and you laugh to yourself. <laughs> sometimes, you know, like you in bed, you sort of start laughing. Bob says, "What's what are you laughing about?" Oh, I'm just laughing about what happened, you know, during the day. But anyway, moving on. Um, <laughs> I'm actually enjoying this right now. Like we're going to get to a place of just really 
we're going to laugh in a bit hilariously. Okay, whatever truth you renew your mind to, you'll be transformed. You know, that is so true because, you know, what do you believe about yourself? If you believe that you're a good decision maker, you will be. And I also heard that um, if you believe that there is a solution for something, your brain will work that way towards that solution. It's about your thinking, isn't it? I've been reading, um, it's such a great devotional. It's um, Carolyn Leaf and it's called Switch on Your Brain. And I recommend it to everyone because it's really good because it even was saying that if you're not kind, it really affects your brain. You know, if you're not kind to people, it was talking about, she had the scripture about love in First Corinthians and uh, love is kind. And if you're not kind, you're not kind to your brain. So, you know, yeah, it's just really amazing. We need not only to surrender our hearts um, but our minds to God. Change comes from belief surrender. It does, doesn't it? You have to surrender some things to, to believe differently. You know, it's really important for God because he says um, there's a scripture in Psalm 2, chapter 2, verse 4, and it says, But the one who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord laughs and scoffs at them. And, you know, right now, I just want you to stand. <laughs> and I want you to turn to your neighbour. And I want you to begin um, to tell you one at a time, tell each other a lie that the enemy has been telling you and I want you to laugh at it. I want you to do that right now that you're going to tell each other a lie that the enemy has been telling you and begin to laugh at that. Come on, come on, begin to laugh hilariously. Laugh at the devil this morning. Those lies. He's a liar. That's really good. What I wanted to talk about now is, you know, um, when love transforms your life, you, you, you begin to re get a revelation that you walk, that Jesus has paid the price for your righteousness. And, um, and I know that Pastor Steve had a fantastic message about that, about walking in the righteousness of God. And I've been really dwelling upon that lately because, um, you know, it, it's not performance-based Christianity. It's walking in the truth. And, and, you know, you'll never, ever walk in the, the, the real promises of God until you get a revelation and claim what Jesus has already paid for you. The righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know, and it's freedom. That it, there's a freedom that comes with that. Such freedom knowing that he's paid the price for you. And uh, Psalm 40 verse 6 says... Um, it's not the sacrifices that really move his heart. Burnt offerings, sin offerings, that's not what brings you joy. But when you open my ears and speak deeply to me, I become your willing servant, your prisoner of love for life. You're a prisoner of love. Isn't that amazing? The Lord isn't interested what you do for him. It's about freedom. It's about knowing that you don't have to do anything to become right. Just before I close off, I just want you to know that you're accepted in the beloved, that you are accepted. And the Lord said to me that if you don't believe that you're accepted, you'll find it hard to love yourself. You'll find it hard to love yourself and to accept others because you find it hard to believe that you're accepted in the beloved. The Father has accepted you. You'll never be unaccepted by God. And that's so amazing. And if you don't feel accepted, it's because you're not believing the word of God. And uh, we have to take his word just how he says it, you know. How do you see yourself? I want you to think, as I close off today, I want you to think about five things. You know, it's important that you believe what God says about you, but it's also important to believe what you think about yourself. And I want you to think about five things that you like about yourself. Because it's really important to um, confess, you know, to, to yourself and to hear that, that you actually, hey, there are things about me that I do like. I know that I'm accepted by God and he loves me, 
but do you feel accepted by others? So, you know, when you believe that, you'll, love will transform your heart and you'll be transformed in, in your relationships. It'll become easier for you to be around, you know, different groups of people. You won't feel out anymore because God never wants you to feel out. He loves you so much. He paid the price for you. Jesus paid the price for you. You know, when I accepted him into my life, it was I said to myself, this is the first time that I really feel loved. I felt the love of God and it just so transformed my life. Just so amazing that I didn't have to be insecure anymore. I didn't have to feel rejected, you know, and I probably made those things happen myself. I was always popular, actually. <laughs> I knew I was popular, but inside I was feeling, you know, insecure and rejected. And he's done so much. But um, as we finish, actually, as we close today, I was just wondering if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus. You know, you need to know Jesus. He's going to transform your life. You know, he's going to take a hold of your life today. And he says, I'm going to give you a new life. But, you know, the, you have to put away the old things. The, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things have passed away and all things will become new. You'll have a new perspective, a new, a new direction for your life. I just really felt to ask anyone that today. Even if you feel like um, you need to come back, you need to, you, you know, God's always there. He always loves you, but he wants to draw you back. Into, into the fold, into fellowship, into connection.